Welcome to our next class seminar. Today we are uh, will be listening to Nathalie Gontier about self causation, evolutionary hierarchies, and time. And we are again kind of like in a distributed situ situation. Some people online, some in the room. If there is any any problem with uh, with sound or anything, if you stop hearing. Stop us, so we'll, like we'll pause, so everybody is uh, is able to follow. Okay. So Natalie, if uh, uh, if you are ready, we can we can start. I'm ready. Starts. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, so my name is Natalie Gonche. I work at the Applied Evolutionary yeah, Epistemology okay. Lab in the Center for Philosophy of Science of the Faculty of Science of the University of Lisbon, and my work is sponsored by the faculty and by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and uh, Technology. And uh, I'm, saying, I'm very happy to, to speak to this group today because I think that many of you know that I have my degrees uh, in my master and my PhD in philosophy from the Free University of Brussels. And uh, it was also uh, through the support of CLEA uh, and the Center, for, uh, Logi the Center for Logic and Philosophy of Science uh, that I organized my first conference uh, on evolutionary epistemology, language, and culture in 2004, uh, together with Jean Paul van Bendingham and Diedrich Arts. And then proceedings of that were uh, published in 2006 in the uh, Theory and Decision Library. And that was something that was made possible through Franz Wuketitz from the Konrad Lorenz Institute. And so I'm very happy to, to be here today at CLEA and uh, uh, I'm also uh, uh, for many years a great admirer of what Francis has been doing with uh, ECHO and with uh, the global brain. And in that regard, uh, Francis is also one of the authors of the Oxford Handbook of Human Symbolic Evolution that uh, I and Bilok and Christina have been uh, editing for more than 10 years now. And so in part six of this uh, handbook, uh, Francis has written a very important chapter on the global brain, and we are very happy with that. Unfortunately, Andy uh, died earlier uh, this month, um, but so the handbook is now in its final stages. And so um, Francis and I, we both participated last year in a conference uh, organized by the Linnaean Society on Evolution on Purpose. And that conference was organized by Peter Corning and Dick Van Wright. Uh, who are members of the Third Way of Evolution. And I'm also uh, a member of the Third Way mm -hmm. of Evolution. That is an initiative that was introduced by Dennis Noble, James Shapiro, and Raju Pukotil. And so this conference was on uh, teleonomy, how can we define purposeful uh, behavior? And so both Francis and I uh, talked here, and that is also why I'm here today to, uh, to, to repeat um, that talk also in relation to the grant that you guys are having with the Templeton Foundation. So teleonomy, I define teleonomy as a problem of self-causation. And that means that if you look into the problem of teleonomy from within evolutionary hierarchies, that rather than look into upward causation or downward causation, the question of teleonomy asks how the focal level can persist over time. And so in that regard, the question of teleonomy asks about self-causation, how the focal level can cause itself over time. And that raises questions of duration and of individuality. And so that is basically the, the short version of my talk. And I think that is uh, uh, very difficult to understand as such. So what we are going to do is we are going to break that down uh, into four parts and that is going to take a, around an hour. So we're going to look into time and how it has been defined in cultural and in scientific history. We're going to look into the correlation between time and causality thinking. Uh, we're going to look into hierarchies and how causation relates to hierarchy thinking. And we're going to look into the problem of self-causation. And so in this regard, I know that in CLEA, a lot of uh, scholars uh, investigate worldviews. And uh, not only have I studied at the Free University of Brussels, I've also studied at the University of Ghent under uh, Hendrik Pinkste. And through Hendrik Pinkste, I was also uh, very much inspired into research on worldviews. And in that regard, one of the things that I have done is from within the anthropology of science, I have looked into how different worldviews within Western uh, traditions have defined time differentially. 
And so uh, I define cosmologies as worldviews that define aspects of matter, space, and time. And matter, space, and time is really a tripartite. When you have a cosmology that talks about time, it will also provide definitions on space and on matter. And so um, if you look into the history of Western thinking, I distinguish between four cosmologies, the cosmologies of the ancient Greeks, the Roman Judeo-Christians, classical physics and natural history research, and um, evolutionary uh, biology and modern physics. And so typical of these cosmologies is that they associate with major cosmographies, which are diagrams that depict the major ideas, the major tenets of these cosmologies. And for the ancient Greeks, major cosmographies are wheels of time and change of being. For the Romans and the Judeo-Christians, it's scales of nature, chronologies and pedigrees. For classical physics and natural history, it's timelines and phylogenetic trees. And for modern physics and evolutionary biology, a lot of what is said is said through graph theory and it is uh, depicted into networks and into vector spaces. And so uh, one of the things that my research has demonstrated is that there is a very strong correlation between how these cosmologies define time and how they define uh, causality. So if you look into the cosmologies of the ancient Greeks, then they adhere to a circular notion of time and they also understand causality as cyclical. If you look into uh, Roman and Judeo-Christian cosmologies, then they start to linearize time and the classical physics and natural history uh, students of the 19th century also linearize time. And then with the introduction of three typologies, they start to understand evolutionary lineages as diversifying. When you look into speciation, you look into how an evolutionary lineage diversifies into multiple lineages. And in that regard, they also start to understand time as multidirectional. And so in that regard, there is also a transition uh, uh, where uh, causality first is understood as the hand of God, but later there is a search for uniformity of cause, which is a linearization of causality. And then later there is again a, a diversification of how we understand causality by through the recognition that uh, a certain A can cause uh, uh, B or C or D under different circumstances. And so today in modern physics and in evolutionary biology, time, uh, the existence of time is called into question. And if time exists, it is recognized to be multiple. So today scholars distinguish space time from geological time, from chronobiological time, phenomenological time, numerical time. So if time exists, it is considered as multiple or it does not exist at all. And simultaneously, scholars have also started to question causality. They have started to question the uniformity of cause and whether at all there is something like causality and instead they uh, understand uh, uh, phenomena uh, as the result of statistical probabilities and of uncertainties. And so these are uh, uh, the major cosmologies and their cosmographies and how they define time and causality. Now we're going to go through that and we're going to look uh, into some examples. So the ancient Greeks, they understand time uh, as, uh, they make a distinction when they talk about time between true time and relative time. And um, typical cosmographies for them are wheels of time and chains of being. And these define a cyclical teleology. So if we look into an example of that, uh, an example that is both a wheel of time and a chain of being is the Western Zodiac, the tropical Zodiac. So the Zodiac, what is it? It is um, uh, a measurement of time and it is a measurement of, of time through the movement of the sun through the houses of the Zodiac. And so one such cycle defines a year and then it defines the seasons, it defines the months, and it can also define the days. Um, and so in this regard, you see that there are different times. You have the, the, the calculations of the months, the calculations of the seasons, the calculations of the, the years. And in that regard, the ancient Greeks distinguish between different times that are relative times, and the, they, they associate these different times then uh, with uh, one true time, which is associated with the platonic great year. And so um, it is then uh, these houses that uh, associate with constellations and these constellations uh, in the night sky are associated with animals. And these 
animal belt is then called a first chain of being. So the concept of a chain of being basically associates with uh, the belt of animals. And in that regard, this is a wheel of time and uh, a chain, a belt of animals. Now, looking more into how they understood uh, causality, another such a cycle that we find is, for example, the, the life cycle. Uh, the cycle of coming and becoming, as Aristotle would call it, or if you look into more uh, ancient uh, cosmologies, uh, more Asian cosmologies, it is called the cycle of generation and decay. So an example of that would be if you look into the cycle of all sunflowers, then what happens is that a seed brings forth the seedling, the seedling brings forth the sprout, the sprout brings forth the budding flower, the budding flower brings forth a full grown flower, and the full grown flower brings forth a dead flower, the dead flower, the seeds drop, and then these seeds recommence. And so this is the cycle of coming and becoming, which underlies a cyclic notion of teleology. Once the cycle is complete, it recommences. And this is also what we see with the year. Once the year has ended, it recommences. And so this brings forth a cyclical notion of time, and it also underlies the cyclical notion of teleology. Now, Aristotle, he stands at the end, at the very end of this very long tradition that reaches back all the way to the Neolithic. And he is one of the first to look into the causes for the cycle of coming and becoming. And here then is where he is going to define his four causes. So uh, he distinguishes between the material, the formal, the efficient, and the final cause. And so he says that if you look into the seeds, of uh, the sunflower, what that is, that is unformed matter that has potential. And then the question is how that potential can become actualized. And uh, first of all, he says that the potential uh, associates with the formal cause. The potential defines the essence of a thing and it asks what uh, a thing is for. And so the essence of the seed, for example, is that it can grow into a flower. How this seed then can grow into a flower is a question about the efficient cause. And then uh, here the answer is that water, sunlight and fertile soil needs to be given to the seed for the seed to become the sunflower. And so this is external to the sunflower and it is given to the sunflower for it to reach its uh, potential. And then the final cause, the end, the reasoning of becoming, why the potential got actualized is a question of why and what for uh, something is. And so the goal in the seed is to grow into a flower. And so Aristotle then said that the formal cause and the final cause, the question about essences and the question is about goals coincide. And he understood that there's an internal strive as an internal wanting. And it is this then that has uh, laid at the foundation for teleology. Uh, and that is sometimes then associated with the question of teleonomy because teleonomy is also often considered as an internal strive and an internal uh, movement rather than that it is an external movement, something that is imposed upon a phenomenon in order for it then to undergo change. But then what happens? So once you have gone through the cycle of coming and becoming, once the seed has become the sunflower, what happens in ancient cosmologies is that the cycle restarts. And so this is what uh, Mircea Eliade called the myth of the eternal return. That's why it is cyclical. It's always the return of the same and the similar. And what happens over the, over the course of natural history then is that this uh, cyclic notion of time and also the cyclic notion of causality becomes straightened out. And that time becomes understood as a linear and as an arrow. And uh, Stephen G. Gould, for example, was uh, one of the first to write about that within natural history, but this is something that starts much earlier in time. Um, so uh, the linearization of time begins with the Romans and with the Judeo-Christians with the introduction of calendrical systems, first the Julian calendar and then uh, the Gregorian calendar. And time in uh, Judeo-Christian tradition becomes understood as created. So the world has uh, a beginning and an ending in time. And then the Judeo-Christian deity stands above space and above time. And uh, causality then is understood as the hand of God. But in association um, with the linearization of time, also the chains of being become linearized into scales of nature. 
And so examples of that are here on the left, uh, the scale of nature as it was uh, described by uh, Ramon Lul. And this is an interpretation that was given to his work uh, by uh, Alonso de Prozoa. And then here on the right, you see another scale of nature uh, that was, as it appeared in the Rhetorica Christiana, where you have uh, the Judeo-Christian God that stands above the chain of being. And so the Judeo-Christian God chains mother nature and then mother, mother nature chains the different entities on the scale and then here you have some fallen angels on their way to hell but so what you have here first and foremost is a spatial way of thinking about how far are close uh, these entities on the scale of nature are from the judeo-christian god that stands outside of creation and it is then these uh, this spatial way of thinking that will become attributed with a numerical timeline and that will then form the basis for natural history uh, research. So um, to look into a third way of thinking about time, uh, if you look into the, the cosmologies of classical physics and of natural history, time there becomes associated with a linear decimal number system. And so uh, that is in fact what Newton says when he makes a distinction between absolute mathematical time and relative time, time becomes associated with a linear timeline. And in association, time becomes understood first as linear and then with the introduction of trees uh, as multilinear. And so typical cosmographies are these timelines and these trees and causality then becomes understood as mechanical. So here, only the how question, the efficient cause of Aristotle becomes understood as relevant for scientific research. And uh, that is the question of how there is external force, how there is external cause. And so the internal striving, the internal wanting that Aristotle talked about and that associates with teleology and also with teleonomy becomes uh, uh, pushed out of that system. An image that uh, uh, depicts Almost all of these ideas uh, and uh, that I like uh, very much in that regard is the, the image that you see on the left, the paleontological tree of vertebrates, which was drawn by Ernst Haeckel in the fifth edition of his book on the evolution of man, the English translation thereof. And what you see here on the left is, uh, you do not only see a tree of life, what you see on the left is the geological time scale and the geological time scale without any numbers. And so what you see here are the different strata as they appear in uh, uh, the, the earth, in the, the earth's layers. And these originally have uh, no number. They are just a, 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 a telling of the data of how the, the earth is, is shaped. And so this then, this geological time scale functions to define deep time and then numbers are only attributed much later in time. And this geological time scale is also non-uniform. It is a, 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 a telling of how the data present themselves in the geological record. And that is non-uniform. So also the geological time scale is non-uniform. And this geological time scale then functions to investigate how species diversify over time. And this then is a diversification of lineages. And this in and of itself also species diversification is non-uniform. There is no uniformity in how species diverse over time. And uh, also in that time, uh, development, uh, the study of development starts and also uh, uh, these are called ages and epochs, but also uh, human uh, development is considered to be made up of different ages and of different stages. And there also, uh, there is no uniformity in the beginning. So you can be a baby, for example, for a couple of months, but you are uh, a grown up for the rest of your, for your, for the rest of your life. So here also you see, and in the beginning, there is no uniformity. But then what happens, and mostly because of the introduction of uh, the Cartesian coordinate system and later also the ideas of Newton, is that there is a, 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 a uniformity that is imposed because of the introduction of 
mathematics and because of the introduction of numerical timelines. And time then in that regard becomes understood as a linear succession of events in motion and causation becomes a linear and timely relation between cause and effect. And so what happens here is that time and Heidegger was, was very able at describing that time becomes a linear uh, timeline, something that can be taken into pieces and you have the succession of different events in time. And so uh, in that regard, there is no longer the flow that Aristotle would talk about, for example. And so causation is then uh, defined as a linear and timely relation between a cause and effect. That means that A will lead to B. There is a predictability that if you have an A, it will lead to B. And also that if you have a B, you have a predictability to go back to A. And so in this regard, there is still teleology insofar as you know the future. There is an end state and the end state is known. There is a predictability of the system. Why? Because of the uniformity of cause. And then uh, uh, Darwin, for example, uh, uh, is, is uh, one of the people that also uniformizes uh, uh, evolution in a way. So uh, what you see here is a hypothetical diagram of how he understood uh, species to speciate. And so what you see here is populations of individuals that diversify, um, but this is in and of itself a, a non-uniform process. So here, for example, one uh, group of individuals will diversify into four, uh, then it will diversify into three. Some of these will go extinct, some of these will go on. So in and of itself, you are looking at a non-uniform process, but he puts that diagram of, of speciation then into a, a larger diagram where you see these horizontal stripes and each of these horizontal stripes then it represents a number line um, where each line represents a thousand generations and then 10,000 generations. And it is through the counting of the number of generations that he finds uniformity in uh, evolution. But then if you look into uh, today's science, modern physics and evolutionary biology, you see that the tree of life is uh, questioned. The validity of the tree of life is questioned. And <clears throat> it is often replaced by network typologies. And in association, scholars have questioned whether there is a uniformity of cause, whether there is such thing as causality, or whether everything is uh, dependent upon probabilities and how uncertain a system is because we know that an A sometimes can lead to a B, but sometimes the same A can lead to a C or a D, depending the circumstances. So there, there is no uniformity of cause. And in regard to that, scholars have questioned the existence of causality and they question the existence of um, time. And if there is time, they understand time as multiple. And then we don't really know if all of them fit into one general absolute time. And in association in evolutionary biology, you see that there is a transition from these timelines and these trees to uh, networks and uh, to unrooted networks. Many of the evolutionary uh, diagrams that are being drawn today are unrooted because scholars do not longer know how they can bring time into the equation. And so summarizing this first part of my talk, when we look into uh, the history of how time and causality has been defined within different cosmologies, we see that there is a correlation. And um, we see furthermore that it would be wrong to assume that teleology is something that only belongs to an Aristotelian worldview. Quite the contrary, <clears throat> teleology is also what defines Roman and Judeo-Christian traditions and also classical physics and natural history because of the predictability uh, uh, of, of cause. While today in modern physics and in evolutionary biology, uh, this uh, is being questioned and scholars ask about statistical probabilities and uncertainties instead. So this is the first part of uh, my presentation. Now we're going to look into uh, causation and in hierarchies and into the question of self-causation. So, um, 
today we no longer talk about uh, cosmologies or cosmographies. Much of current research has been toned down in that regard. But we still talk about hierarchy and causality theory. And hierarchies, in a way, are the modern replacements of these uh, cosmographies because they ask what the ontological status is of the universe, how we can depict the universe. And then causality is often defined from within hierarchies. And so uh, causes are found and defined from, defined from within these hierarchies. So what do I mean by that? So uh, we can distinguish between four different kinds of hierarchies, aggregational, linear, nested, and interactional hierarchies. And these each associate with different forms of causation. So aggregational hierarchies are basically the classic distinctions of species into genera. And so there is a, a, a data that is being uh, provided, but there is no, no causal uh, reasoning behind uh, uh, that. But then uh, linear hierarchies are these uh, hierarchies that associate with these timelines, for example. So you have a serial and a sequential successive or consecutive arrangement of units in time. If you look into natural history, you can say that uh, we start off with the Big Bang and you have chunks of time until we have the now. And so this associates with the linear hierarchy. And uh, this linear hierarchy has uh, uh, was very typical for natural history research, but it often leads to false causal reasoning. So for example, if you look into uh, uh, geological strata, um, we know that Neanderthals precede us uh, in the geological strata. But, and because of that, scholars have long assumed that Neanderthals were our ancestors, but we are not directly, uh, uh, we did not directly evolve from the Neanderthals, and we also did not directly evolve from, from the chimpanzees. What we know is that we share a common ancestor. And so we see here that there is no lineage, no linear line. We see that there is a bifurcation and that both of us go back to a single point of origin, to a single common ancestor. And so this uh, is something that uh, enables us to, 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 to realize why natural history research was often wrongheaded by assuming that there was this linearity in time. But um, uh, today, uh, the evolutionary hierarchy is often uh, redefined. So uh, if you look into genes, organisms, and species, this is typical of what is called a nested hierarchy or a constitutive hierarchy. A nested hierarchy is a structural arrangement of units into a new level or the partitioning of a level into functional units. And so uh, what you see here is that Again, if you look at natural history research, if you look into this linear uh, uh, timeline, we know that genes precede organisms in time and genes will bring forth organisms and organisms will bring forth species. But beyond this being a linear hierarchy, it is also a constitutive hierarchy because it is assumed that genes not only precede organisms in time, they constitute organisms. And organisms not only precede species in time, they constitute species. And so this is what Meyer uh, called the constitutive hierarchy. And it is from within these hierarchies that scholars define up and downward causation. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. But here too, um, it is false to assume that these hierarchies are correct. And this is perhaps more counterintuitive, but we as organisms are not only the sum of our genes, we are also the sum of our environment. And this is something that is not part of this hierarchy. In order for us to see how we as an individual are not only the sum of our genes, but also the sum of our surroundings, we need to look into uh, interactional hierarchies. And so these interactional hierarchies I'm gonna show associate with networks and associate with reticulate causation. And so I define interactional hierarchies as multidirectional reticulate interactions with between units belonging to different levels of the same or different hierarchies. Again, it's a mouthful, but we're going to uh, break it down. The point so is that if you look into these hierarchies and these uh, uh, causalities, um, it is a different way of looking into ontology and epistemology and in looking into the map and the territory. And so much of what I'm going to uh, talk about now is uh, being published in this publication. And it is also a publication where uh, Didri Katz uh, wrote uh, a chapter for. 
So going back uh, to Aristotle, it has been said that with the introduction of Newtonian physics, uh, uh, only the how question that asks about external mechanism is raised. This might be the case for physics, but it has never really been the case for evolutionary biology. And evolutionary biology has always asked what questions, definition questions, questions about form, how genes, for example, constitute organisms. And they have asked about how behavior constitutes an organism, how there can be goal-oriented behavior. And so one of the scholars to make uh, this thinking respectable, again, within evolutionary biology was uh, Ernst Meyer. And Ernst Meyer, he made a distinction in a paper on cause and effect in biology between functional biologists and evolutionary biologists. And so functional biologists, he say, ask the how question. The functional biologist is vitally concerned with the operation and interaction of structural elements. His ever repeated question is how. How does something operate? How does it function? And his approach is essentially the same as that of the physicist and the chemist. And so this defines proximate causation, but proximate causation he defined based upon genes. And he assumed in his time, typical of his time, that there were genetic programs and the genes constitute organisms and that organisms in a way are the sum of their genes. Um, and then evolutionary biologists, he said, asked the why question. He said that evolutionary biologists differ in their method. His basic question is why. It may mean how come, but it may also mean the fatalistic what for. It is obvious that the evolutionist has in mind the historical how come when he asks why. And so here he makes a distinction between the why question that is directed to the past and the what for question that is directed to the future. And here is where you find teleonomy. And this then is what he uh, defines as ultimate causation. And he defines ultimate causation with natural selection. So it is natural selection acting upon the organism constituted by genes that then uh, brings forth um, evolution. But in this regard, very important, Meyer uh, and also typical of his time uh, assumed that natural selection acts upon existing variation, that genetic uh, material is, is blind, that, that mutations are blind, and um, that natural selection then uh, uh, selects amongst these variations. And so natural selection is not responsible for the uh, genetic variation that is found. And then uh, a scholar such as uh, Richard Dawkins uh, no longer makes that distinction. And he says that natural selection can also act directly upon uh, genes. And in that regard, he also says that methodologically, functional and evolutionary biology is the same. And so he says, what kind of explanation for complicated things would satisfy us? We have just considered a question from the point of view of mechanism, how does it work? But another question uh, is how the complicated things came into existence in the first place, and then the same general principle applies as for understanding mechanism. And so here he says that the historical and evolutionary origin questions also require a functional approach. And so uh, he says that adaptations require the what for question. Now, in that regard, this would bring forth a, a debate, which is called the units and levels of selection debate. And so the units uh, of selection, the unit classically was the phenotype, but Dawkins then says that genes can be the unit of selection. And then the how of evolution was answered through natural selection. Natural selection was the mechanism of evolution. But with the units and levels of selection debate, there is a new question introduced in evolutionary biology, the question of where evolution occurs. If you say that genes can be selected, if you say that organisms can be selected, you're asking yourself the question of what the locus of evolution is, where selection occurs. And in that regard, um, looking at these different questions, and this is what I call applied evolutionary epistemology, you can even define evolution as that what occurs universally when units evolve at levels of an ontological hierarchy by mechanisms and processes. You can read about that in, in my, my writing. I'm, I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, that very much. But so the, the, the basic point here is that we need to look into evolutionary hierarchies into ontological hierarchies, as soon as you assume that there is more than one unit of, of evolution, genes and organisms, you need to look into how they are structured together ontologically into a hierarchy. And so let's look into how uh, evolutionary biologists have defined that. So uh, classic neo-Darwinian uh, thinking will tell you that the unit of evolution is the organism, that it evolves 
at the level of the environment by means of natural selection, which is the mechanism. And so what you have here is a mechanical account of how evolution occurs. And so if you look at uh, that from within um, a hierarchy, you have the idea that genes bring forth organisms and that organisms bring forth species. And so uh, causality wise, you are talking about upward causation. Uh, genes bring forth organisms and organisms bring forth species in time and then selection is something that operates on the organism from within the environment. And so if you look at it from within a hierarchy, you have the idea that lower levels will bring forth uh, the focal level and the focal level will bring forth the upper level and so this defines upward causation. Now, upward causation is typical for research in natural history, and um, it looks into um, evolutionary affordances, how genes afford the evolution of organisms, how organisms enable the evolution of species. And so you look into how things evolve over time, you look into temporal change. Now today, a lot of work is being done in Evodevo and in Eco Evodevo, where scholars not only investigate how uh, genes bring forth organisms and organisms bring forth uh, species, they ask whether how species evolve can influence how organisms evolve and whether how organisms evolve can influence how genes evolve. And so this is something that uh, is researched within ecology and in ontology, in ontogeny in developmental biology. And so here scholars look into constraints. But here, this is something that happens in the economy of nature. If there is something that is constraining how genes will evolve, then that happens within the economy of nature and that we are looking into spatial change. And Eldridge in that regard has said that you can combine these uh, uh, hierarchies, that on the one hand, you can look into the genealogical hierarchy which is a hierarchy of how genes constitute organisms and how organisms constitute uh, species. But on the other hand, if you want to investigate how uh, organisms interact with one another in the economy of nature, you are looking into an economical hierarchy, the ecological hierarchy. And so you need to de combine these two to have both upward and downward causation. But we can even go further than that, because uh, today um, uh, there is also a lot of research being done on reticulate evolution. And so reticulate evolution is evolution as it occurs by means of symbiosis, symbiogenesis, lateral gene transfer, hybridization, and infectious heredity. And so what happens there is that through lateral gene transfer, for example, genes of one organism, part of its own lineage, somehow transfer in the economy of nature to the genome of, an organ, of another organism belonging to an entirely different lineage. And if you try to depict it into these classical hierarchies, you simply cannot. It is impossible. It becomes messy, it becomes ugly, and it becomes unclear. Um, but we know that these processes occur and that they occur a lot within uh, the economy of nature, that they also underlie, for example, holobion formation. And so here we need to uh, uh, introduce a new concept of causality, which I have done. I have called this reticulous causation. So if you want to look, for example, into the process of hybridization, into how one organism of one lineage hybridizes with an organism of another lineage, you need to look into reticulate causation and you need to uh, look into the network-like interactions that can exist between different hierarchies. Summarizing, so far we have seen that the locus of causation has been shifting over time, and we can see that through the study of hierarchy theory. So in pre-evolutionary views, um, causation is something that is considered to be external to an existing hierarchy. A classic hierarchy of pre-evolutionary thinking is the inorganic, organic, superorganic. And so here forces or laws uh, are considered to be imposed upon that system from the outside either natural laws, gravitation, for example, or the hand of God. It is something that is imposed from outside the system onto the system. With the introduction of the modern synthesis uh, and with what Meyer defined as proximate causation, uh, this older hierarchy becomes redefined into the hierarchy that is uh, constitutive and where genes constitute organisms, organisms constitute species. 
And natural selection for Meyer is something that remains external to this hierarchy and that is imposed from the environment onto the organism. When you look into the extended evolutionary synthesis there, uh, scholars recognize not only upward causation, they also recognize downward causation. But what happened there, and this was a mistake, is that they only looked into one single hierarchy and they try to define upward and downward causation from within that single hierarchy. But then environmental selection or the external uh, part uh, uh, was left behind. And that is also one of the reasons why Niles Eldridge then um, said that we need to look into that from within a dual hierarchy. And then today, if we look into uh, current evolutionary studies and if we look into reticulate evolution, then we see that if we look into the interactions that can exist, the reticulate interactions that can exist between different units and levels belonging each to their own hierarchies, then we can see that we can um, uh, distinguish between many more than, than, than two hierarchies. We can basically, um, the in a way, lateral gene transfer, when a gene of one lineage is transferred to a gene of another lineage, or when you have something like holobiont formation, what happens at that moment in time is the establishment of an entire new hierarchy. And each individual has its own lineage, and these lineages are, lineages are very fluent. They are very dynamic. And so in that regard, um, the, the challenge of our generation is to try and make sense of, of this hierarchically. Okay, so uh, we have now looked into causation and hierarchy theories, and now the question is from within these structures, where then finally, after all of this, can we talk about self-causation? Well, self-causation is the question of how the focal level can persist through time. And this is another framing of the question. So. Um, it is not a question of upward causation, it's not a question of downward causation, it's a question of how the focal level can persist through time. Now, um, and how that focal level can somehow cause itself. Because if you assume that the lower level causes the focal level or the focal level causes the lower level, you are looking into how there is external force. But Self-causation asks whether there is some kind of force available at the focal level that is able to generate the focal level at another moment in time. Now, um, in general, it's a bit of a mind twist and it is something that has been uh, considered to be false. Because for example, we are the children of our parents. We did not make ourselves. We cannot cause ourselves. And that's true. But now that we are here, is our behavior made by our parents or by our environment or by ourself? Who here is the agent of my body? And when you raise the question like that, you see that it is not at all that simple uh, to say that the questioning like that is false. So let's look into the question. Um, one of the things that has happened here is we have looked into the matter by adding time. We have asked ourselves the question, I am the, the, the daughter of my parents. I did not cause myself, but now that I am here, do I cause my own behavior? And we see that this is a question that requires a framing in time. And if we look uh, back to our uh, classic example, when we add time to that equation, when we ask, for example, uh, how uh, the seeds of the sunflower generate over time, then we can ask ourselves the question, how the seed at one moment in time brings forth the sprout, how the sprite brings forth the seedling, how the seedling brings forth a budding flower at different moments in time. And here you see again the paradox, because when you add time to this equation, you see the chunks of time, the different events, the succession of events of matter in motion, you see how different entities in time bring forth different entities. And then you have the questions of our time. The question is, is there continuity between the seed and the seedling? Are the seedling and the sprout the same individual? Do they have some kind of duration or are all of these different entities in time? And for in, like that, we start to see the problem of um, teleonomy. 
But here is also a question, does there need to be continuity in time? No, because we know, for example, that uh, if you look into uh, genetic replication, genes bring forth genes over time, but there can be mutations. So there does not need to be identity, but there is some kind of continuity. And we are interested into, in, in that continuity. And then the question is, does something like that exist in biology? And I think it does. Genes can bring forth genes over time through replication. Organisms can bring forth organisms through time to reproduction. And species bring forth species through time to through speciation. And now, of course, you can say, yes, but for an organism to bring forth another organism, you have to have genes that bring forth that organism. And that is also true. But then you need to look into that uh, from within uh, a reticulate hierarchy. For example, if you look into sexually reproducing organisms, you have to have genes that bring forth the organism, genes that bring forth the other organism. The two organisms need to interact within the economy of nature. They have to have uh, sexual intercourse. They have to have a successful sexual intercourse. There needs to be an individual. It's a mess before you can describe that hierarchically, all the, the components that are needed. But at the same time, when all of that is there, the organisms brought forth organisms over time. And so in that regard, teleonomy asks about the, the perpetuation of the system through time. And that is a, a very normal question to ask, I think. And one that is also necessary that has been ignored too much uh, within evolutionary studies and that can be uh, introduced. Uh, we have upward causation, downward causation, uh, reticulate causation, and then there is the perpetuation, the self-causation over time. But then there is another question. There is the question of whether any of these then, any of these levels in this hierarchy have more power or more agency over the other ones. And this is also a question that relates to the question of teleonomy. It is the question of whether a level in the hierarchy is able to control the regeneration or the perpetuation of a multi-hierarchical system. So if any of these levels has, has more standing, more control, more agency over the regeneration of the system. That's also something that associates with the question of individualizing causality. And that is something that has been raised and, and that we work with in our everyday lives. So for example, if you look into law, a delinquent, for example, might say that he has bad genes and he has bad upbringing and bad environment, but it is a delinquent that will commit the crime and that is also prosecuted as such. So there we assume that the delinquent, whatever entity it is, has some kind of agency over all of this. Whether or not true, it's a question, but it is something that we work with. Uh, also, Peter Corning, in a very important paper uh, uh, of the previous conference that they did on evolution on purpose, how behavior has shaped the evolutionary process, there also we see how behavior can influence the future course of evolution. Also, at uh, genetic studies of, of James Shapiro, for example, demonstrate that there can be directionality of genetic mutations at, at that molecular level, so that there can be directionality given to the system. Also in the cognitive sciences, Maturana, Maturana and Varela, they talk about uh, autopoiesis, which is also something that needs to be understood uh, in that context. And also uh, we, for example, the entire earth can be understood as, as a recycling of a previous earth. We bring forth the living earth, we bring out the dead earth that was before and we bring it into the present by evolving and by just being in the world. And so in that regard, there is some kind of perpetuation there and uh, that is uh, valid to study scientifically. And so in that regard, I will uh, end with a quote and I will say, uh, with Rich, that if a system passes through several phases of becoming in succession, all controlled by unified causality, we may speak of the evolution of the system and every singularity of becoming that leads to the unity as the final end may be called purposive or teleological. And so with that, uh, the question is whether um, there is something like self-regulation agency or like a Gaia on higher levels. And there also, the image that I showed you was uh, 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 the organism. 
and how the organism can have more agency. But there also we could basically ask ourselves the question at any level uh, where there would be more agency. For example, if there would be a Gaia, then the agency would not be at the level of the organism. It would be at the level of the ecosystem, for example. So this is something uh, that I do not know how to draw, draw it's a mess, but um, that does not mean that it is not a valid question. And so with that, we come at the end of my presentation. And uh, I want to say that I have this book series, Interdisciplinary Evolution Research. I'm always happy to hear uh, uh, proposals. And uh, beyond that, here is some of my other work. And I want to thank you already for my, uh, Marta and Francis for the invitation. And I look forward to questions. All right, thank you, Natalie. I suppose we can unshare the screen so that everybody is visible yes. and uh, stop. Yeah. Yeah. There. Okay. Who would like to start? Comments, questions? And complaints. Compliance. Compliance, yes. Let's start with those. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take the plunge, I'll start. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much for such a enlightening talk. Uh, I never thought about time in evolutionary terms. I, I always thought of time in terms of uh, electromagnetic waves, photons, maybe relativity and stuff like that. Uh, uh, your talk just got me thinking and it's a point I just want to share with you. Uh, is is a human being eternal? Is 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 there no time for a human being? And, and my answer is yes. Uh, there's no time for me because I was thinking about it while you were speaking that we are all made of atoms which were formed 14 billion years ago, and those atoms haven't changed. And our constitution is made of those trillions and quadrillions of atoms and and they repeat themselves. So the atom in me was probably in Alexander, <laughs> maybe a thousand, two thousand years ago. And the same atom was in, you know, uh, Lord Buddha or, or, or whatever. So yeah, I, I, I just wanted to share this time. <laughs> <laughs> time. I think it's a beautiful question. And I, I totally hear where you are coming from. And this is this idea of cyclicity, right? The idea that, and this is something that I have written about that I call the, the recycling of the living earth. In a way, we are in fact always regenerating existing matter and energy in different ways. And there is this cyclicity there. And we, um, uh, in that regard, constantly bring to life a previous earth in a different moment in time. We choose to take parts with us. We, we lose things along the way, but we are constantly perpetuating and bringing to life what used to exist uh, uh, in the past. And in that regard, um, uh, uh, we can actually say that um, in the present, for example, that material can be more than what it was when it was alive. So um, what do I mean by that? For example, trilobites, right? Trilobites, they lived their lives 500 million years ago and then they went extinct. But today they are part of our world, not in the way that they were you know, when they were living their lives. They are with us as fossils. We see these fossils as evidence of evolution. We use these fossils to give tutorships about evolution. We put them in museums and in that regard, this trilobite today is so much more than what it was when it was living its life in the past. So in that regard, uh, I think, yes, there is some kind of eternity. And added value as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think he disconnected. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's he's getting disconnected, and, but oh. keeps coming back. So yeah, I have come back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, Who I, next? I missed, yeah. I missed the last one minute actually. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, I was giving an example. I was saying uh, if you look at trilobites, for example. 
So they lived their life 500 million years ago, but today we use them uh, as, as uh, evidence of evolution. They are with us as fossils. And we use them, we put them in museums as evidence of evolution to torture uh, uh, children and all. So in that regard, a trilobite today is more than it was when it was living its life. <laughs> And yes. uh, in that regard, there is some kind of eternity and some kind of added value uh, as, as uh, we go on. Yeah, as long as we don't end up destroying our own cells. Yeah. Francis? Uh, yeah, Natalia, I wanted to ask you this term, uh, reticulate evolution, is that your term or is that a more general term? And do I understand it well that it is a kind of a networked evolution, meaning that there is both up, down, left, right, circular, etc., possible connections? Well, um, I don't think it's my term, reticulate evolution. I think. Uh, um, I have defined reticulate evolution as evolution as it occurs by means of symbiosis, symbiogenesis, natural gene transfer, hybridization, and effective heredity. Um, and, and that associates with my book on, on reticulate evolution. But reticulation in general is, is a concept that is uh, used to, to talk about interactions that exist because of, for example, natural gene transfer. But so what I have done with the term is, is I have, I have uh, used it as a container for all the different kinds of, of uh, symbiosis, symbiogenesis, natural gene transfer, etc. And so, um, um, yes, uh, and reticular causation is, is my term, yes. Yeah, I was I was wondering what is the next uh, kind of you know like when you when you have those uh, those vertical and here you you, you kind of like uh, conclude that the last the, the right one is this uh, this you know like multi directional multi scale causality so like the like the, the sense is that like okay giving up the causality altogether just think you know <laughs> interacting and like why why trace causality if it becomes so messy yes like it's just so uh i'm just just wondering what um well yeah that is a question can we describe the level of complexity that we are going to um i think there the answer is that we need big data we need computer programs to do it and um i think now is the best time uh, because before it was un impossible and now with these computer programs but then the question is can we still understand and make sense of of, of what uh a simulation like that would be that yeah. is a question yes I don't know. Yeah. So, like the the more kind of intricate and complex this network of like mutual causality and reinforcement and everything would become, I imagine that the picture might be that you can ask a question like not like how each point is caused, but how each point is causing and what kind of agency each point has over the entire network. Yes. So we kind of like a flip flip the and question. Over time. Over yes. Time, yeah. Yes. Yes. Because then that's another factor when you add time to the to the equation. It's like like, and if you if you see time as a succession, like no 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 no, like uh, it, it's incredible. Like how how do you? I don't know. Yeah. So you might you might ask a question. Okay. So you take any single point in the entire network and ask the question: How much time do you need to persist with your idea of influence? to change everything, you know, and it's like, okay, like, okay, maybe for a few thousand years, but, you know, like, you can do it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but in fact, we do it all the time, and like, uh -huh. uh, I think the, 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 the average age of a human being these days is, is like 70 for men and 80 for women. There are trees that do it for, for 500 years, I don't know, like, how do they do it? It's, it's, they, they seem to be able at it, so, but we can we model it is the question yeah and another another kind of reflection i had uh, when you distinguish this like this difference between self causality in this focal level versus upward and downward if you distinguish those distinct like this the existence of those other levels upper and, and, and lower it's actually an analytical choice yes because 
you, you, like you draw genes organism yes but like like what is like where do you have genes if not in the within the organism so this is an uh, analytical kind of uh, distinction because you are looking at the organism yes and okay like it's a little bit different with populations because like you see one or or many but you could argue that like it's it's a, the difference is basically the difference of framing because if you like don't in, introduce this analytical division, you have always self-causality and you have always this, uh, this cyclical thing. It's only when you, when you distinguish the, like, you know, something from something, then you can ask the, this kind of like, you know, like mutual causality, causality question. And, and it like, when you, when you give this example, am I causing like my own behavior you can say yes, or you can, again, like behaviorally or psychologically differentiate within your, you know, like a habit, idea, desire, whatever. And once you create such an analytical framework, you shift from self-causality as a whole to this, you know, upper, lower, you know, like, and, and, uh, and other, other compositions, yeah? So this kind of like self kind of generated trick those differences in a, in a sense yes self on the on the side of the of the you know like um, one who's building the model i, I suppose yeah so it's a, a very interesting points uh, different points that are being made um in that regard um it is most certainly true that the units and levels of selection debate is uh, very atomistic. In the beginning, it was oh, there was the Meyer. There's the unity of the the phenotype, and and uh, the entire organism evolves. But then, uh, with the introduction of uh, uh, Dawkins and all that said that it is uh, the gene that evolves and that is more uh, that has more survival value than than organisms. There was an atomistic uh, search for what it is that evolves, and in that regard, the the individual became. Uh, a succession of uh, different entities and um, that were uh, ripped apart. And then in that regard, um, uh, it is most certainly true that that can go on at infinitum because you can, you can there, there are studies published on that that demonstrate how a single gene can be the subject of selection. So somehow you can prove that scientifically that a single gene is a subject of positive selection and another gene is, is, is uh, uh, evolving more randomly. So um, there is a possibility to measure that. On the other hand, of course, there is the question how you put that together and how rich it is this hierarchy. And, and I myself am uh, uh, very much against the idea of rigidity. Um, in that regard, that, that uh, a unit, for example, of evolution can also be a level of evolution. It's also what we see with holobiont formation. A holobiont is a habitable zone of life. It is not only an entity that evolves, it is also a place where other entities can evolve. And so sometimes what is a unit of evolution can also be a level of evolution. A level of evolution, for example, or a unit of evolution can also be a mechanism of evolution. Um, it can it can sometimes induce change. Um, so in that regard, there again, uh, uh, analytically speaking, the, the 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 level of complexity is is enormous because units can be levels, they can be mechanisms, all at once. And then again, the only answer that I can see there is that we need to look into these uh, interactional hierarchies. Um, uh, I don't think that there's a wrong or a right here. Because atomistically, we can we can prove that an individual uh, uh, in a certain environment will behave differently than in another environment as a unity. Uh, while at the same time, it can like we, we regenerate every three weeks. We have different cells, and still we are this unity. So um, yeah, there's there's a level of complexity there. Um, that, that also involves a choice, of course, because we are unable to, 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 to make that entire uh, image. But it is there. It happens. Hmm. Francis? Uh, I wanted to go back to the issue of agency, which is a word that nowadays lots of people use, but that is very difficult to define. 
So my definition tends to be that an agent is something that can act on its own, meaning that if there are external influences, that it can somehow neutralize or compensate or ignore these this external influences. So for me, agency is when the system gets some degree of autonomy that it can make its own actions independently of what happens in the environment. Uh, would you agree with this kind of characterization? Yes, I, I, I agree with that. And that is, in fact, again, the question of theonomy. Like, where then do you, do you um, place the entity that is able to make that choice? Because that is the entity that has the power to direct a system a multi-hierarchical system and to say, yes, I will ignore this and I will uh, move in that direction. And that indeed is this agency that is teleonomy. Yeah. Well, that is uh, a bit the, the core question of our project. Uh, we don't use the word teleonomy, but the word goal directedness, which has the advantage of being more explicit that you want to have a system that moves towards a goal and that will not let the environment push it away from that goal. So, so our approach is to emphasize what we call resilience. Resilience means you get pushed out of where you want to be, you get back, you jump back to where you wanted to be. So that has to do in part with this self steering, this self control, but also with the ability to, to counteract all these perturbations. And that's something I didn't see in your talk, uh, this ability of contacting perturbations. Well, yeah, this is, I find it a very uh, interesting concept. And that's that's exactly like what I, what I was talking about when I uh, was saying that there is some kind of level that has more power. Um, and so that's, that's how I would frame it in, in, in the framework that I gave, that there must be a level that has more control um, over... Um, the variables of a system and that then is is what you define as resilience yes how would you define it causally like where where would you put the causation for resilience uh well the model i use is a dynamical system and the dynamical system describes the causal processes inside the system and if you have a dynamical system with an attractor that has a very wide basin, a basin of attraction, that means that the dynamics is such that if you move out of the attractor but you stay within the basin, then the dynamics of the system will be such that it pushes you back to the attractor. So a bit like the example of the ball in the bowel, if the ball is pushed up, it will roll back to the lowest spot. Now that's a, a, a static example because the ball is not really actively doing it, it's using the force of gravity. But if you're a biological system, then it will be your internal dynamics, not the dynamics of gravity that will push you back. For example, if I get cold, my organisms will start to do uh, certain chemical processes that produce heat. If I am too hot, then my body will start to produce sweat so that I cool down. So it's the internal dynamics in my uh, organism, which is a number of causal processes that have evolved over many millions of years, but that now are kind of solidified in a particular kind of organization that is highly resilient. Yeah, going against the flow, like flying, for example, in birds, it's, it's, it's mechanical in a way, but in a way, where, where does the power eventually come from? when flying occurs. I think, I'm not sure whether the question is whether it's like, where, where is the level of, where is this focus? I think it's rather the coordination of the whole, the interaction of the whole system, where, where it comes from that you cannot really say this level has more, more control or this part is controlled, but it's rather the coordination of the whole. In, in the case, case of the bird, I would say it is definitely in the bird. The question is, if a bird flies in the wind, which thing will determine where the bird ends up, the bird or the wind? If the wind is so strong that it blows the, 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 the bird away, then it is the wind. But in most cases, the bird will navigate the wind and compensate for the wind and still end up at the branch where it wanted to go. 
So that is the goal that is the boat will get to its goal in spite of the wind pushing it from one side to the other. Yeah. Yeah, and it generates its own power by doing that. Huh? It is a stronger power than, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in regard to, to your student also, yes, there, there is this coordination somewhere, but there again, that is that can be understood as a level somewhere, there must be a level doing that coordinating. Um, for, for example, with the bird, the one that coordinates there, like you have the wings, but then like you, you, you already have like uh, brain impulses um, uh, that are sending commands in a way to, to, to the wings. Again, my answer to that are interactional hierarchies, but the question is, can we draw them? Do we know how to draw them? Do we know the multiple factors? Because there again, you can always go, and this is also what Marta was saying, you can always go very atomistic and like make it into pieces very analytically, but where do you draw the line? You can go on at infinitum, or you look into it as a whole, but this, uh, understanding everything as, as one single whole, is also the question what 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 kind of a theory do you develop when you just say ah oh, it's the whole that does this it's the whole that does that like does that provide sufficient explanation um, uh, if you look into to the history of science the, the the attempt has always been to break things down into smaller pieces to then see how there is interaction of cause. This is this is of course our kind of like you know our culture intellectual culture academic culture to do that yes and uh, and I, I I keep wondering about it you know like this the sense of understanding that we get after we have like chopped enough you know like okay so you have distinguish 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 draw the lines and you know like uh, those lines appear if you distinguish then you can you can create influence yes but it's a kind of analytical operation that creates this description fine you know like the and by by the the virtue of having this sort of thinking we can have engineering and everything and everything but if you like if you ask the question okay so what does it lead us if you see like holistically and more holistically and more holistically i think it also leads us in an interesting uh, you know direction because uh, imagine this you try to like to see as holistically as possible you know when you cannot do that anymore when there is like a conflict of forces Yes, because like some like uh, and and now I'm speaking kind of like an animistic word or something like that. You can like you can say ah oh, reality is just you know like self generating and doing all sorts of things, but it's doing simultaneously many different conflicting things. You know, and then when you when you trace this kind of like you know like uh, clashes, this is like self causality in uh, in multiplicity. Yeah, so like. Uh, but I, I, probably not a not an engineering idea anymore because I don't know what it, what it leads to. But I, I, I think it's also interesting to like to to not divide to to draw those uh, circles in a, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're, for example, yes, like atomistically, we are all these cells, uh, all, all these individual cells, they regenerate all the time, made up of molecules, made up of atoms. But there is this unity, my arms don't fall off by themselves, like, they're, they're, they're like whatever I, I, I can slap my hand, <laughs> it, it, it does not get off, it's, it's there. If somebody yeah. takes a knife, it's gone, like very easily to, to mm -hmm. cut off my arm. Yes, yes. That's an there. interesting observation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe regarding this question of um, uh, control, if you look at the whole as a network of interactions, and then you ask the question, which part is having the control or um, directing? So maybe it's the part which has the most connections to all the other parts, because we're talking about networks the whole time. And if we are looking for the answer to the question, which part is most in control or has the most influence, it's the part with the most connections to all the other parts. Oh, I, I, I seem to remember that we had this conversation already kind of like similarly uh, worded. Mm -hmm. at, at least I remember that I, I had this kind of like counter example that I, I know that this is like in, in those network science, this is this is one of the like possibilities of, of thinking, but think of a household and a, uh, and a situation where 
the one who has more like involvement and connection with everybody else is the servant that like works for everybody and cleans everybody's rooms yes so like you will have an agent that is like most connected with all and everything but you cannot say it's a controller yeah so yeah, yeah but then we took the, the example of the the cleaners in new york who were um, on the strike yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the people in the streets and they had the most influence on the city so yeah. we had when the bankers go, went on a strike, they didn't have influence. But when the street um, cleaners went on a strike, the whole city was uh, in chaos. But so but does it mean like okay, fine? Yeah, that's but another, it's, other level of, of control. Yes, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does it mean it's a controller? Yes, it's kind of like a substrate maybe that needs to be there. You know? mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But there again, like you, because there is also, there's no need to, for it to be one level of control, right? Like for example, um, uh, my body at this moment is controlled by my heart, by my lungs, by my breathing, by me, whatever me is, but like by many things, like by the oxygen in the room. So there are many levels that, yes. that enable me. And uh, uh, in that regard, like walking around or, or being alive is dependent upon many. When there is a serious failure in any of these, no matter how good the other systems are, it will be the end. Um, if you take away the oxygen, everything else can function, it will not work. So in that regard, again, we can see but then also again, analytically, there are many different levels that together bring forth this control. And there again, it's it's an interactional hierarchy that that uh, we cannot, we still cannot draw. Mm -hmm. We cannot uh, because we can go at infinitum. Like how many? Because like I am there as an individual. I am there with my genes. I'm there with my lungs. Like half a lung, full lung. Like you know, it's difficult. Yeah. So what is what is the question, Natalie, that you have, or kind of like a problem that it's intriguing you in all that is is there something like you are you know like what uh, okay like what's what's the you know what's causing your interest in causality <laughs> well so one of the reasons that that i i got here it was for for finding a place for reticulate evolution and for understanding reticulate evolution from within this historical background Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, um, I, I have been trying to integrate reticulate evolution within these frameworks and how, how we can uh, think about that. Um, and in that regard, the, the goal is a description, a more accurate description of how the world is um, through reticulate evolution in that regard. Yes, at this moment in time, I'm very, very captivated by time. And... Um, uh, also with this teleonomy, I see this as the biggest problem is how do you have, like teleonomy for me at this moment in time is really like bringing in time into these, these uh, networks. And that is something that I hadn't been thinking about that much neither. I had been saying, okay, so you have this reticulate interaction, but in a way this can still also be understood as static. So now we need to dynamize it even more by adding time. But there I'm, I'm uh, a bit um, uh, in front of a blank myself. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm reading on time, mm -hmm. maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you are basically like with, with that, uh, you are like, you're, you're working towards building a cosmology, yes? Which is, well, which would be different from the ones that are available historically. I suppose really, really that it eventually is a building of a cosmology, yes. Um, yeah. Do we have time? I want to add, uh, I want to ask uh, a question that's been nagging me for a long time. Uh, how did life come about? Uh, so I, I'm a reductionist uh, by my philosophy. So I, I believe in a scientific principle of how life came about. So there was an organic soup and there was some energy, some lightning strike, and there were a lot of protein molecules which were formed. which somehow interacted with each other to form some kind of basic life. Okay? And then they formed cells, which is again such a complex procedure. So great, I can give one in trillion, trillion, trillion chances that life came about, so which is fine. Probability brings life. But what I don't understand is how did life decide to replicate itself 
and uh, you know winning a lottery once is fine but winning a lottery every day is something <laughs> uh, so so what is the role of free will is there any desire uh, what is desire uh, can an atom have a desire if so where does it come from so these kind of questions uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> more bordering on philosophy uh, i i i do think about them Again, a very, very interesting question. And um, because that's another, it's, that's one of the, the world's biggest enigmas, the life that we know today, all of it is connected. When we go to the, to the beginning, there might have been multiple origins, but even if there were multiple origins, what exists today is connected. And, and it's, it's the same DNA, it's the same amino acids, it's the same RNA. And um, there is this evolving unity, no matter how it diversifies, there is this evolving unity. And I, I find it interesting, of course, how you, you ask whether there is this one thing associated with that. Um, I think it's a very interesting question because again, it it asks whether there is agency at the very origin of life, even if life was an accident, although there are studies that that demonstrate that there was a, a, again, a probability given, like if everything is there in the soup, it's probable that life will uh, originate, but you have to have everything in the soup and how does it get there, et cetera, et cetera. But, Life has not let go from the moment that it was there. Although they're also questionable because there are these studies that demonstrate that like molecular systems can make the jump from being alive and being dead, you know, like at one point there, there was this, this, this uh, jump back and forth. Freeman Dyson has, has written about that, very interesting. Um, but again, the life that is there now, it does not let go. And, and why is that? Why does life not give up? You know, like it gives up on, 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 on individuals, but why does life not give up on itself? Why does it not restart anew? Is that a scientific question? Is that, I don't know, but I find it very, very intriguing. And uh, I, have, I have no answer, but there is something there that does not let go. Is that a one thing? I don't know, what, what do you think? I, I think it's again a, a matter of time, you know, like you are asking this question from within the duration in which it hasn't. And <laughs> because otherwise, you know, they might have been like, and, and is many opportunities to ask this question where it like when it's not there, but there's nobody to ask, you know, so it's kind of. <laughs> So, yeah, it can be a question of opportunity again, like it functions and as long as it is <laughs> able to, it will. Uh, and then yes, at the end of time, uh, when, when the sun hits no longer, et cetera, et cetera, it, there is no opportunity, so it will not be. Because of course, also, yeah, if there would be another life form based on other things, first of all, would we recognize it as a life? And then there it would be uh, perhaps able to make a comparison. Yeah, it seems that you know like there are so many places in this universe where life like isn't yes <laughs> it's also it's possible that it gave up so like the very question why it doesn't give up is from within this like this this dure yes this like the like why i why do i like why don't i die you know i can ask like i can keep asking this question only as long as i'm as i am alive yes so I'm like, mm. well, I sometimes I feel it's uh, when I think about evolution, I think uh, the best energy flow principle, which means uh, forms are made in a manner where uh, preservation of energy is its maximum. So if I have to make a human being or even a small bird or an earth form out of nanoparticles and nanomolecules, they will be 1,000 times uh, less effective in, er- in terms of energy as a natural uh, earthworm or a natural human being. Uh, therefore, any uh, biological system uh, is made, has, has become in a manner that is energy efficient. So there, there, there was a question 
is life only biological, right? Uh, so I, I heard one of uh, uh, one of the lectures on YouTube, and they said life could be made of magnesium molecules. Uh, who says that DNA needs only carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen? You could have a special DNA made of molybdenum or even iron, right? And and that life would be different from what we are. Next is how how do I see life? I, I, I see, I see in the visible spectrum of 400 to 800 nanometers. And that is what to me is life. If there is a light in the ultraviolet uh, region or there's a light in infrared region, I cannot see it and I cannot know it. Only my Hubble telescope can probably know it. I don't know if, so yeah, so, uh, so I, uh, since I told you I'm a reductionist, so I, I till the time I don't see God I, or, or, or I cannot feel him, I will believe everything uh, that I can do with observation. Uh, even God, I'll try to prove with science. So uh, I, uh, scientifically, it appears to me that uh, when the first molecules were formed, uh, probably they found, they felt that this was the most energy efficient way to combine, and they combined. But how they repeated themselves again and again, I don't know how that information passes. Uh, there is a certain... Uh automation in uh, uh, DNA replication and, and uh, uh, if you look at the, the, the function of ribosomes, there is a certain automation, but still the process needs to be, uh, uh, the, the process needs to start and needs to end. And you have these codes inside of the DNA, a start and an and, and end code. Um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I, I have no no particular answer to the question. It's, it's very funny because last last week we had uh, uh, last week and a week before we had the seminars about transdisciplinarity and we were so uh, kind of self congratulatory in like we are asking big questions you know but <laughs> yeah but there is there is this aspect to asking big questions that we have no answers whatsoever you know so it's it's also kind of like comes together with with this yes that we are, like we we turn into preschoolers and we just you know ask. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, and bias towards our being. There's right? courage in asking tough questions and failing. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. actually, our project, our important project, is asking the big question of the origin of life, or as we call it, the origin of gold ion systems. And actually, we claim to have some way to find the solution. It's still not there yet, but. It's an idea that I think was implicit in lots of the remarks made now. Uh, what we call a chemical organization is a self-maintaining network of processes. So you have processes that initially are just ordinary causal, local causal processes. And at some moment, the one feeds the other so that the whole becomes self-maintaining. And mathematically, you can show that that is relatively easy to happen. So we expect that something like that happened with life, that a number of chemical processes that were going on in this primordial soup at a certain moment became self-maintaining or which is similar autopoietic. That means that whatever was consumed by one process was produced again by another process. And then you get something that becomes autonomous because the moment that it can kind of keep itself going, then it develops some kind of a separation some kind of an independence from the environment but then of course it can be still very fragile because if one of the let's say the food molecules that it needs to keep going disappears then it will die and so the next step in our scenario is that first become self-maintaining and then it gradually becomes more and more resilient that means the self-maintenance will organize itself in a way that it becomes less and less sensitive to changes in inputs, uh, environmental perturbations. Yeah, it makes me it makes me think about the comparisons that are made between learning and evolution. And um, uh, there's a lot of research there that demonstrates that over time, there is uh, indeed this, this redundancy in tasks that, that things become uh, uh, self-made and easier to produce because of it, which enables energy to become free to do other things. 
and so in that regard like if, if you there's there's a, the analogy with, with learning if you see for example when you start to learn to drive a car you have to look at everything but eventually that becomes so automated and you become so able to do it that then at the same time you can have a conversation and you can listen to music etc cetera, etc cetera. and and so there is this kind of learning there uh, and 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 an automation that occurs and you can also find that uh, in evolution in in how self um, uh, acquire entities that's also one of the reasons um that there is sometimes uh, symbiosis that that uh, uh, you have these individuals that as soon as they are born for example look for certain microbes that will take certain functions for them um that will uh, that's what we see for example with the gut mi gut microbiome they they do functions that we cannot perform and through the food that we eat we instantly have them None of this is conscious, like we, 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 we only now know that we are doing that, but this is something that, that somehow life, whatever entity it is, if there is an entity or, or a being that is, is like uh, uh, selected for, uh, for, for portraying that kind of behavior. Well, I, I call it mutual adaptation. You have all these different entities, each of which is adapting to the others, which in turn are adapting to the first one. And if they do it long enough, in the end, they form an organization which is keeping itself going. And I learned an interesting new concept in biology recently, syntrophy. Syntrophy is a kind of symbiosis in which the one produces a molecule which the other one needs and vice versa. So you have different typically bacteria or microbes living in a certain environment uh, where they help each other to, um, to digest the food without getting poisoned. So the one helps doing things which the, the metabolism of the other one can't do. And so the whole keeps itself going together. So syntrophy is like eating together like they are digesting their food together while each one is doing part of the of the job yes yes yeah and then these 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 sometimes become automated eh? that's that's one of the things that we see like for example the bobtail squid which is uh this this small squid as soon as it starts hatching it starts to roam the surface it looks for bio for, for bacteria that will become bioluminescent it can if they can go travel to the light organs then they they have some kind of quorum sensing and uh, all of them together then start illumination and that uh, helps the organism to, to avoid predation, for example. But then in the morning, uh, it pushes out like 95% of those bacteria because it's too costly to maintain them and to feed them. But then at night, it mm -hmm. takes them back. So there's this, this uh, um, constant symbiosis, constantly new organisms that together form this... Uh, hollow biont and and that that have some kind of persistence through time because of that but then there of course there's a question like where is there this individual like is there still an individual because it's constantly different communities each day and that is also something where we we find that um the way that we have evolved to see individuals and to see holes, etc., is is how we perceive the world, but it is not how the world is, and and uh, um, the we the I is a we in many ways, you know, like based upon my food, I am a different person this morning than I am this evening, etc. Uh, so in that regard, the, the, where is there a unity? Because there is still eventually something more me than there is this environment around me and that there is over the years that I am in existence. So this probably is a question that has already been asked. So the problem of self-causation is also a problem of defining the self then. What is the self? Well, yes, so that, that's one way of, of, of uh, looking at the problem of self-causation. So when, when, when I ask about what levels are there uh, providing directionality to a recurring system over time, a multi-level system over time, then um, 
Yes, you can ask, for example, if there is some kind of self that is uh, maintaining or being maintained um, over the course of time. Yes, for example, in the case of humans, we are half, half, half of humans is, 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 are actually back, are bacteria. So in this case, the self is half human, half bacteria, but these bacteria, yeah, okay, no, I'm just... Uh, I think it's more like two thirds is bacteria, and then there's you, and also these bacteria they change all the time. There's mm -hmm. there's like our cells re rejuvenate all the time, our microbiome changes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so is there some kind of self, some entity, or are we like uh, very like? Uh, uh, natural history research, like the succession of different chunks in time that like have no necessary connection at all. Yeah, so the, this this lands in in basically in uh, consciousness studies, you know, and the, the self is kind of pheno phenomenological uh, production of the of the sequences, yes, and as as long as it manages to produce this the perception of continuity relative to the continuity itself, this is what we call self. Yes? <laughs> but it's kind of like the, the, the question is like how the, the, the perception of self is produced. Uh, there also self, duration, time, all of that is related. As soon as you assume that there is some kind of self view and that there is some kind of flow of consciousness, you in the mind take different events in time and you make a narrative in that and you start to travel with that narrative in your mind. There's a, a interesting work on, on that being done by uh, Francesco Ferretti in Italy, and also Michael Corbalis in uh, uh, New Zealand, I think, or Australia, I think New Zealand. And and the flow of consciousness is is um, uh, a narration of events that are being chunked together into a single narrative over time. And there again, like the question there is the first answer you need to give there is whether time is or is not real or whether it is a fiction of our imagination because the two are connected i think but that is strange i mean you, you can have the narrative but there's so many cells living next to each other and you cannot deny that i mean even if you're continuously re replenished i see you now and, and in so many months still as the same you so, I mean, it's not just your own narrative. So, that's a bit, you know, if you, if you reduce it to that, I find it hard to believe. It's like, that's a single, as if, if there were only one individual, I would buy it. But there's so many living next to each other that seem to persist next to each other. Yeah, but you are, you are saying this as one of many of the same type of an organism. So, we are kind of like doing like a similar trick, yes? And, and a bacteria, you know, like might disagree that it's just, uh, like such a unity. You know? <laughs> you know? yeah. My cat would agree. So it's like really like the, depending of what what kind of like a you know organism is is being asked uh, of its opinion. Yes. No, but you were talking about self, and if self, then I yeah, think yeah, what yeah. you mean is mm -hmm. by self is really you, self, me, self, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, it's running around. Yeah, but it's kind of on a population level because like you you have you have the sense so you assume the same about the same type of organisms yes yeah but my dog has the same impression and he recognizes me and he's not thinking like me so i mean this is still okay we would have to ask the dog i, I will ask the dog <laughs> when we finish but... <laughs> you know like if you if you ask psychiatrists there are many uh, individuals that actually don't have this continuity and you have all sorts of splits so this like the, the, the famous good breast, bad breast, you know, like split of the mother, you know, that there are two different entities and one is like vicious and horrible and another is so lovely and, and you know, like full of milk and that you basically, <laughs> you keep uh, keep dividing your perception of, of okay, these are psychiatric, uh, you know, like uh, parlance if you, if you bring it to, but you know, like they, they do argue that the humans are not really like so co continuously, you know certain about uh, about uh, individuals some some 
you know, mm -hmm. psychiatric yeah. cases. So uh, with the dog, you know, like you're making an assumption here. <laughs> can be like the, the you that doesn't want to, go, want to go for a walk is a completely different you than the one who does. I, I think I, uh, I feel time has evolved. Time is, uh, you know, the time uh, when, when universe initially started, uh, there was no time. Uh, when, when a photon moves, it doesn't have any time. So if, if I see a galaxy, which is uh, 50 million light years away, I know it as 50 million light years, but the photon coming from the galaxy sees itself as in instantaneous from that galaxy to me, because for it, for it, it's time is still, if a photon, photon can understand time. So uh, time evolved for matter to make sense. Sense, how do we define make sense? Make sense about the world. Now, if, if for a human being, time doesn't exist, then for me, every new moment is, is a fresh moment. How do I survive if every moment is new to me? I think time is, has evolved by virtue of matter wanting to survive, matter wanting to enhance its efficiency. If I, oh, so it's about entropy. Uh, if I don't have memory, I have no time. Because I have memory, I have time, and therefore my survivability increases. Therefore, I don't think a lot of people say time is eternal. Of course, I made that comment myself. But for me, time is eternal in terms of matter that exists in me, not in terms of flow of time. I don't believe that time flows. Uh, time flows because matter can think. Is there time for a stone? Can stone think? I do not know. Can an atom think? So which is the smallest particle on this earth which can think? And that which can think has time because thinking needs time. If I think in this moment and think fresh in the new moment, I will not have any thinking. So, uh, so that is how I, I see time. Time as, as, as an evolutionary necessity for survival. And you link it to memory. Yes, I, I, yes, I link it to memory, yes. Uh, because, uh, because how do I enhance my survival if I do not know what, I, what mistakes I made? What mistakes I made in the past? How do I, not, how do I prevent myself from repeating it if I, don't repeat, if I don't remember it? But why did I want, why do I want to survive longer? Why do I want to survive another 10 seconds? That I do not know. But a rock, for example, can have erosion over time without knowing it. Uh, I, I couldn't understand. Say again. A rock, for example, can have erosion over time without knowing it. Yeah, but does rock have consciousness? I do not know. Hmm. So what is consciousness? I used to think consciousness comes from God or consciousness comes from intelligent design uh, till the time I heard Dr. Sol, uh, Dr. S-O-L-M, I think, and he was speaking about the reticular activating system in the brain. And he says, if our complete cortex, neocortex is damaged or is missing, uh, there can still be a sense. Uh, you can still have a sense of being. Uh, you can understand emotions. But if your cortex remains absolutely fine, but there is a small damage in your reticular activating system in the brain stem, then you will lose all consciousness. You cannot make sense despite having a fully functional brain. Uh, so again, this is a reductionist theory. So, ha so did our reticular activation, that activation system in us, in, in reptiles, in, in other forms of life come about because there was a desire to survive? So this, uh, this issue of desire is something I've never been able to hold grip, to get grips to. How, how did desire come about? I do not know. Because everything is linked to desire. If the first uh, cell decided, decided to multiply, was it, uh, uh, was it an energy-related system or was it a desire-related system? What was it? And 
and his desire a function is desire a function of uh, is desire does desire evolve from material re, uh, combination recombination or is desire uh, supplanted by god or by that intelligent design how does desire come about does does earth have a desire does sun have desire i don't know Yeah, well, I must say I'm not a, a fan of intelligent design, but this desire, you know, this is something that that uh, in in uh, uh, Asian philosophies and also in in Aristotle is is uh, uh, very strongly there, and there it associates with the, the idea that there are essences, right? That there, like for example, that the the seed of the sunflower wants to become. Uh, the sunflower, and that there is this internal strife, this internal wanting to become a sunflower. And in that regard, today a lot of that is 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 defined from in genetics. Like there are genes that make a sunflower uh, different from another flower. Like you know, like with barcoding techniques, for example, you can say ah, there are some specific genes that define the sunflower for the sunflower. But um, there again, you know, if you look into evolution and if you look into uh, how uh, the sunflower came about, then the sunflower stems from uh, flowers that were not sunflowers. Um, and, and so the sunflower came into being because there were genetic mutations, etc. So in that regard, um, did the ancestors of the sunflower, for example, want to become the sunflower? Did they want to evolve themselves out of existence to become a sunflower? Difficult, because then there, there, there was like a, a kind of a, 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 a death wish in a way of the, the previous sunflowers, of the previous flowers that evolved into the sunflower. So in that regard, you can see how, how desire can be difficult um, uh, as a concept to, 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 to um, uh, think about in scientific terms. Um, I don't know, maybe somebody else wants to say something as well. I have, I have another association with psychoanalysis uh, that there is this, you know, idea of the drive, dev drive exactly to, <laughs> to come handy in this, you know, that yes, there is a desire to disintegrate. Yeah, but, uh, but it's again about people, not, not sunflowers. Francis, you wanted to say something? I think that uh, desire is the same uh, as what we call goal directedness. That means that there is something you don't have that you would like to have. And I think all the goals and all the desires ultimately come from this self maintenance, which is the same as survival. Natural selection selects things that are good at surviving, which things are good at surviving, those things that have a desire for doing the kind of things that make them survive. So why do I have a desire for food? Because to natural selection, all those people who did not have hunger and did not want to eat food, they have died, they have disappeared. So that means all the ones that remain are the ones that have an inbuilt desire to eat food because without food, they will die. So that for me is a very simple explanation for desire. Desire is what helps us to survive. And surviving is what natural selection has selected us for. Yeah, but there are, uh, you know, uh, again, not about sunflowers, but there are desires to kill yourself. There are desires to kind of get drunk and whatever, you know, so not not all desires are, you know, of this sort of, of the self maintenance, like in a... The desire to take risk. Yeah. No, but there is the, the ultimate underlying desire of self maintenance which then goes into a lot of more concrete desires, for example, for eating, and some people eat so much that it actually makes them live less long. So that means that the mechanisms that have evolved to go towards the survival, they are shortcuts, they are not necessarily aiming at the right things. For example, desire for suicide, one explanation may be that you have implicitly a desire to conform to the expectations of society because those who did not conform to the expectations of society typically would not survive as well. And then you see that you have failed the expectations of society, so you may feel like I'm not worth anything and you will kill yourself. So it's an indirect way of 
getting uh, of, of let's say this instinct of wanting to fulfill the expectations of, of of society on the long term has made people survive more but for the individual case they lead to suicide you would say that homostasis and desire could be considered uh, interrelated yes i would say that desire is a step towards homeostasis if you define homeostasis in the very broad sense of maintaining the continuity of the, the, the autopoietic process. And that's, that's the word I also wanted to do when we were speaking about self. What is it that makes it myself is still myself, even though all the molecules and bacteria, et cetera, in my body have changed? I would say it's because of the continuity of the process of self-maintenance or autopoietics. So the process, by definition of a process, it's changing matter. But if the process has the same loop where it's continuously rebuilding each other, you might say this continuity of process. And anything that contributes to that continuity of, of process will be selected for, and that will typically include desires for the kind of things that are necessary to continue the process, like a desire to eat food if you're hungry and a desire to fulfill the expectations of your social group, if you are a social creature. We are reaching the time uh, limit for today. So is it okay to, to close or is, it, is there anything that anyone needs to like really like ask still or say? Okay, so <laughs> that was that was uh, suggestive, you know. I suppose. No, just to just to keep uh, to keep us within the, the time. Bar. So, Natalie, uh, thank you so much for for your wonderful presentation. Very informative and got us into all sorts of places, as as you've <laughs> as you've seen. So it was like very you know like opening many many different directions of, of thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was a very interesting discussion thank you uh, and i hope you will keep coming back uh, the next week we are we are having like almost every week now the uh, uh, session next week there is nothing but in two weeks from now uh, we have a seminar by mateo mosio not still not on the website but but it's already confirmed it will be about modeling biological autonomy so two weeks from now uh, in the room or zoom we're meeting at, at two o'clock Brussels time. So thank you uh, and see you see you then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you.